Welcome to the On Purpose Podcast, where together we will learn from personal stories and explore thought-provoking topics, all with one goal in mind, living a more purposeful life. Welcome, everybody, to this week's edition. Edition of the On Purpose Podcast, where it's always an honor to be here with you. I'm excited, and honestly, you're going to feel the excitement when this guest comes on. I'm excited for her, but boy, does she bring some energy. But before I introduce her, I want to remind you, please like, subscribe, share the podcast, whatever apps you're listening, follow us along YouTube, social media. And quite honestly, it's you all, it's the community, the movement that is the On Purpose podcast that keeps us growing around the world. And remember, we exist to brighten the days of people around the world by sharing inspiring, thought-provoking, and purposeful content, just like this week's interview with our guest, Dr. Toby Tomlinson Baker who just recently released a book called The Traveling IEP, chronicling her life as a student with learning disabilities as she goes on to earn her PhD, becomes a college professor, and her goal in life is to inspire post-secondary students with disabilities to not just enter college, but to graduate. And her story is fantastic. Her energy is high level, and she actually was called scrappy at one point in her life and I'm going to tell you when I sit and I listen to this young lady from Philadelphia sharing her story scrappy is definitely the vibe I get from her so sit back and enjoy this week's interview with Dr. Toby Tomlinson Baker. Dr. Baker, Toby welcome to the On Purpose podcast. How are you today? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for having me today, Jared. Thank you. I appreciate it. It is an honor to get to share your story with our community. And I always get excited when I do research and I read some stuff. I'm like, oh, I can't wait to ask some of these questions and and learn more about the who behind the what that goes on in our world. So thank you. Yeah. So So um, you got a book out right now, The Traveling IEP. Yes. Go ahead and throw it out there. There you go. (laughs) There you go. So, That's good. Yeah. So that kind of crossed our paths. Yeah. And I, I was really interested when I saw your name come up as potential guest because <laughs> our son went through the educational process with an IEP. So we had a lot of experience with it from the parent side. So I was really intrigued by like your data and the studies you've done. And quite honestly, one of the things <laughs> I read about you where your goal in life is to inspire post-secondary students with disabilities to not just enter college, but to graduate. And I'm like, okay, let's, we got to get this story out so people know where to find you and follow along. Jared, you hit the nail on the head. Um, when I started, and I'll backtrack, but you hit the nail on the head when I say this, that um, so many, there's so many college experts out there that get students into college. And in my research, this is, you know, years ago, a very, you know, researchy thing, um, 72% of students with disabilities get into college and drop out, 72%. And that's what struck me is, um, you know, I had to at that point, at that point, I wasn't sharing that I have a learning disability in ADHD. Uh, I was diagnosed as a child. Um, with a learning disability because it took me twice as long to read. And that's very common for, um, you know, you need double time, you need extra time. That was my thing. I read half of something and, and the teachers would say, well, how come you're not finished? You're not keeping up. You know, how come your my test scores, I was bringing test scores down for the, the class and my age peers. And you, we get into college, but then all those supports go away and I'm very scrappy. (laughs) So I have many hats. So I'm also a college professor at Cal State LA. So I step into that role and I always tell other professors, why not just give, you know, the accommodations to everybody? You shouldn't have to ask for access. It should just be there. And so that's one of the things, like I said, I wear different hats. But so I have, you know, that I'm the student with a disability. I'm also a post-secondary student with a disability. I have earned my PhD and less than 1% of the world 
have disabilities with 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 eighty with um with any disabilities that have earned a, a higher education doctorate. So um, I'm I keep getting smaller, you know, the smaller and smaller and smaller. And how come? So I the big question is why can't students like me i want them to graduate i already went to college i want them to graduate so that's exactly the true thing they get into college but they're not graduating and nobody enters college with the dream of dropping out nobody right so um you know when you go to call you know i'm gonna enroll in college you picture in your head i'm gonna do this and then i'm gonna get a diploma but 72% 72% of students with disabilities are not doing that and it's increasing. Um, and so that was why um, I wrote the traveling IP and we can talk more about that. Yeah. Um, how I got from, you know, um, how things happen in, in K through 12 and why it doesn't just travel, travel, literally just travel over to college. Yeah, I love it. But before we get so, too deep, before we get too much yeah. heavy lifting, one of the things I really like is I got to warm you up, right? Like I got <laughs> I to yes. make sure we get to learn who you are behind some of this stuff. So are you ready to warm up, Toby? Yes, absolutely. All right. You're stranded on a deserted island. You get one food. What do you want to eat the rest of your Chocolate. life? Chocolate. Chocolate. You, you had that one ready. That's, <laughs> I love chocolate. You have to. How can you live without chocolate? Chocolate, cocoa, chocolate. You got to have chocolate. Okay. So Good. unless you, unless, uh, maybe a second is pizza, but chocolate, I would take chocolate over pizza. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. If you could have a superpower, what would you have and why would you want it? I think a superpower would be, um, I, I would want to. I'm I'm very articulate and I'm I think I would want to share that with others. I want others to have more power. So I think I would want um other people to be able to speak. I want other people uh, to feel less afraid. So I would want to share that. Pa- I, mean, I I think if I had any superpower, it would be my ability to speak public. Sp- I love public speaking. Um, I love communicating. So I would magnify that and share it with everybody. Okay. I love it. <laughs> yeah. That's most people's biggest fear, right? So you take away a little bit of that. Yeah. <laughs> I've never been afraid so, <laughs> of, of public speaking. I have other fears, but not of public speaking. Not that one. All right. Favorite yeah. book? Right now, I'm reading Ed Milet. I love it. So I'm reading that and um, Man's Search for Meaning by Frankel and Simon Sinek. Um, yeah. Start with why. So, yep. Excellent. If you could have dinner with one person, who would you have dinner with and what would you want to ask them? Um, off the top of my head, I think I would probably say Simon Sinek or uh, some of my favorite people like Mel Robbins or um, these are the, uh, and, uh, you know, when I listen to podcasts or read books, those are the people I gravitate to. But um, I would probably, if it was somebody that wasn't alive, I would definitely probably a politician, maybe like um, uh, Churchill or Lincoln or somebody like that. And I would definitely ask them questions about leadership because that's what I majored in is how can I just be a better person and be a better leader and, and help others. So, um, yeah, that's because they were, they were models of, of helping uh, They helped the whole, they helped the world. So, sure. yeah. Yeah. So how are you feeling? Are you warmed up? I am warmed up. <laughs> All right. Yeah. You come in ready to go. I can feel it yes. from you. All right. So talk to me, Toby, take us back to your childhood when did you first like notice wait a second i'm learning differently than everybody else yeah um and i wrote this in my book um i changed the names obviously but when i was in i I went well first off i went to six different schools k through 12 so that's essentially every other year i'm switching schools but early in um first and second grade um i that was when i wasn't uh, finishing things as fast as other people. I had to sit in the front. Um, I, 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 I needed even just uh, small accommodations just to focus better. But see, I wasn't diagnosed with ADHD till I was 41. 
So girls with ADHD, that wasn't a thing. Little boys had Ritalin, but I did not have that. And so focusing for me, I was, and they put, one of my teachers put me right next to the window. It was great. I didn't have to listen to anything all year. It was so great. I got to just stare out the window. <laughs> so, uh, but, but I, um, I remember doing a writing assignment for a teacher and I didn't do it right. And I'm like furiously writing and writing. And I'm like, this is the best thing I've ever written. And it's great. Both sides, full description about the shore or whatever we were writing about. And um, the teacher didn't like it and said it didn't like every other student did three sentences. And I'll just never forget. I was like, wait a minute. I wrote like 40 sentences. How come you don't like my sentence? I already did this. I did more than everybody else. So as an, a switching hats, as an adult teacher, why would you diminish somebody who's doing above or attempting to do above? Maybe I didn't do the assignment right, but I I produce. Why would you make somebody feel like they weren't doing it? Why would you, any teacher make somebody feel inadequate or that they weren't doing something right? Uh, when I was, I was, to me, I was doing an excellent piece of work and I wanted that to be valued. And I think to a big takeaway is teachers today get stuck in the way they envision it rather than the way that the person who's producing it envisions it. And why not, if you're truly letting a child be creative, let them be creative. Why stifle them? Because you have a different picture in your head. And so, uh, you know, that's where uh, as a child, going back to my child, very quickly, I don't know why, even, even though I was totally immature, I challenge teachers, not in the same way that a boy would, where they, you know, have uh, ADHD symptoms of physical. I challenged them straight up and said, I, in my own way, I disagree with you. I don't like the way you're teaching me. And so it was sending letters home to my parents, having me stay after school, having miss recess, having all these punitive things. And I didn't see what I was doing is wrong. And so I... I would switch schools, switch schools, switch schools, because it seemed to me, um, now looking back, those teachers couldn't teach me the way I needed to learn. And and that's, you know, it's it's a fault of the system. I know that they have a certain way to have, they have like standards they have to meet. And, but that was my experience was that in early education, before I was old enough to really express myself, um, I was very much a people pleaser. That's something about ADHD. Uh, women particularly, excuse me, women particularly with ADHD tend to um, feel, they internalize and they are people pleasers. And that was me. I wanted to please, but for some reason I was never able to because I challenge the teachers so let me, and let me ask was, you right yeah. there so <laughs> tell me let me ask you something right there yeah so as a as a young person to be able to advocate for yourself and challenge your teachers took courage thank you but, uh, <laughs> let me ask this but also i want to know did did your parents support you challenging teachers did they embody did, did they allow you to be like hey you speak up yes and no uh my parents uh, have always supported me. They've always supported me. They disagreed with me and they did things that I thought were wrong. Or maybe I disagreed with them. Sure. And that was a problem. But, um, and they admit later, they admitted later that they made some mistakes and that's okay. And, and I just mean that, you know, I, I think I, when it comes down to it, as I got older, when a student says they don't like school, listen to them. Yeah. That's, you know, if a, if a kid comes home every day and says, I hate school, I hate school, I hate, don't just say, oh, you're in a, oh, you just, you know, this, it's, it's raining outside. Yeah. Uh, no, if, if it's something constant, um, you know, as I got older, I started to, you know, I, I had a, it was okay in some of the classes. Some of the teachers were excellent teachers. Um, others were not. So 
it just depended on the teacher. And that's actually what I write about in the traveling IEP is how do you connect with your professors? How do you connect with your teachers? How do you find that one person that's going to support you? Yeah. So that was, so that's yeah. interesting, right? So, because I think a lot of people would speak up if they knew their parents would support them, right? But just like you said, parent, a lot of times we acquiesce to society. So we say, just go with the norm, just flow, you'll figure it out. Um, instead of speaking um, up. Yeah. I, when I was 12, I went to a, a parochial private school and it was a horrible experience. Um, they were trying to control me and so forth, but I, um, and they wanted things done their way. And, you know, it's funny because now when I talk to my dad about it, who's in his eighties, he says, well, that's just because they wanted things done a certain way. And that's not how I do things. I do things my way. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't fit in there. And then they asked me to leave. So it was like, well, Toby doesn't fit in here. She should go to another school. Well, that's usually what happened every other year. That's what happened with my, my poor parents. In that sense, I feel sorry for my parents because they always got, why isn't she conforming? So... I did try to people please though, and I find that a lot of students try to do that, but then they're not able to um, get the support that they need to, to express themselves. They may um, experience depression, they may experience um, uh, just, you know, very negative things. And I, I always, I mean, here's the thing, I love school, so I love learning. I think kids should love learning, and I don't think them learning should be based on a teacher's expectation. You know, I'm very uh, student-centered in that. What do, what do you want to learn? How do you learn best? Well, what do you, where do you want to sit? In some ways, why not give the learner, in, in other countries, they, they don't call them students, they call them learners. And so if you're the learner, how do you learn best? Interesting. So now what about this, though? What if people say... <laughs> They don't know how they learn. They're still learning, so they don't they don't understand all the options of learning. How would you what, what would you say to somebody that says like I don't want to give them this much input yet? The student? Sure. Why not? It's their education. They should know as much. I mean, you know, I I I think, you know, if you there's no reason why students can't love school. There's no reason why they can't love school. It's, it really comes, when you think about school, you think about your, who's your favorite teacher? Well, it was the, you know, who did you connect with? What, who was your favorite teacher? Not the one you got assigned to. Who's the one that you mentored and you couldn't wait to see every day? That is your true teacher. That is your, that's who's yeah. going to imprint uh, you and I have those people. Um, there, you know, I have a handful of wonderful teachers. Many of them were my English teachers because I was just writer from the beginning, and um, and and they they saw that. I mean, even one of my math teachers in high school, um, she knew that I was a better writer. So I would, you know, other kids were handing in their geometry homework, and I said, oh, and underneath my homework are some poems that I wrote, and she was like. <laughs> cool so again just understanding that I'm not a math person I'm I'm very you know left brain right brain that kind of thing you know so um uh but that was you know high school was different I went to so many different schools um but elementary school was tough because I was still growing I didn't know everything and I was trying my best to please and I didn't know why I was the way I, nobody told me I had ADHD. Um, nobody told me any, you know, they're like, you're going to visit this doctor today. And I'm like, okay, I guess that's because my mom said so. But when I was 11, 12, 13, 14, it was much easier for me to say, well, why? Or what does this mean? Or I read that report. Why does it say that about me? It's one of the things I, I do talk about in my book. Students don't read their own reports. Wouldn't you want to know what people were saying about you? People, they're on social media because they can't wait to see what somebody wrote about them, but they won't read their own IEPs. Why not? They should. They should know what people say about them because it's important and they can disagree with them. 
Right. If they and, don't, if you don't agree with the doctor, tell them. Right. And for our, our community that's not in education, IEP is an individualized education plan. Right? Mm-hmm. And, and for mm-hmm. my experience, I, I still remember being called in when our son tested way below averages and was having speech development issues. And the IEP, quite honestly, ego-wise, as a parent, I will tell you, I was like, oh, man, that hurts, right? Like, you don't want to say, okay, yep. our, our boy is behind. But then I will tell you on the flip side, the services we got because of the IEP were fantastic. Yep. Right? Therapeutic yep. play group and speech therapy. And, and our son now at 22 wouldn't be anywhere near where he is without it. So talk and, to, let yeah. me ask you this question, though, because I, I bet some other people have felt this way, too, as a parent – like I said, it's a kind of a blow to your ego, right? You don't want to admit, okay, my, my little guy's got something wrong. How can we get parents to buy It's not that, that they have something wrong. He learns differently. Right. There's right. nothing wrong. I will challenge anybody who tells me there's something wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with me. I sure. earned a PhD. Yeah. Your, your child, that's what I would tell them. Your child who has an IP can be the president. You can be the governor. Our governor of California has ADHD. Right. So, so help they me get learn the- differently. Sure. <laughs> and that's great messaging. And, but now would you also agree that getting the parents on board, especially at that young age, is critical? Yep. Absolutely. And that's very hard because there is that whole thing of, and, and I'm not a parent. I'll put that out there right now. So I'm doing this vicariously. You would know better. You had a dream for your child mm-hmm. already, and then now they're shifting. So I don't know how that goes, but that doesn't make them any less valuable, any less. You know, when you start putting who's less, who's more, yeah. my IQ is not as high as the person next to me, or I'm taking a test with 50 people and what are they getting right and what am I getting wrong? One of my experiences at the parochial school, which I did not enjoy at all, um, when I was 13, uh, I was the only one in the class that got 100 on the spelling test that week. Uh, for some reason, I was that was my thing. Couldn't do math, but my <laughs> my yeah, oh no, yeah, math was not my thing because I I literally was like I don't like math. I'm not doing it, and sure. so I literally just did as much as I had to do. Like they say that quietly quitting stuff. You know, that's kind of a silly way of putting it. But I was like, I'm not doing that. But then I had hundreds on the spelling test, and the other girls in the class were all like, What did you get? Oh, I got a 94. Oh, I got a 90. Oh, I got a how did Toby get a hundred? I'm like, because I, 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 you know, I am smart. So are it, I challenge anybody who says, are they not smart? Yes, we are smart. So why? Because we learn a different way. Teachers have to start. And it's what years and years and decades later from when I was in school, but teachers are very stubborn. So when teachers say to me, oh, you don't understand, I'm like, yes, I do. I'm a teacher. I'm a K through 12 uh, special education teacher in Pennsylvania and California. And uh, born in, I was born and raised in Philadelphia. And so I have a lifetime certification there. I have two lifetime certifications. I moved to California because the weather's better <laughs> and we love the beach. And so, um, but, but why... Um, are teachers so, in a sense, they're, they're rigid and stubborn and I'm going to do things this way because this is the way we always did it. And my mother was a teacher and I'm doing things the way she did them or whatever their excuse is. Um, it, that's what it is. It's an excuse. You can be creative. I do tons of hands-on projects. I love teaching. So I get to be up and about and you know even during COVID I was you know just like we are now dancing with the kids and I had a second grade second grade uh, students with with um in a special day class and I had a second grade uh, K one and two um and they all have ADHD learning disabilities and so forth uh we had a blast so again how do you how do they learn how do you learn right. and so you know, and then I'll let you lead into this, but how come students are successful K through 12 and then they jump to college and everything plummets? Mm. 
And that that's my big question is why can't we just continue that? If yeah. they were successful in high in high school and they graduated from high school, why not transfer those same services like you were talking about services that's yeah. exactly it it's not a secret none of this is new none of this is a secret the only thing that's different is nobody's really thought of gosh it would be so easy if it just traveled with them and you, so it's so different in college mm. I, yeah so. so let me before we jump to college i want to something i found research in this is that you said reading Simon Sinek's book, Start With The Why, yeah, was really what brought you to, okay, what is the why of me? So talk to us about that experience and realizing that this passion for IEP advocacy yes. was going to be your why. Well, I was very um, grateful and, um, you know, I had uh, the opportunity to study at Pepperdine University. And uh, when I was there the very first day, they showed us Simon Sinek's um, uh, YouTube uh, video, Start With Why. And since after that, I was hooked. I was like, that's, that's what everybody needs. And for me, it was very quickly, you know, why, why was I, why was I born? What is my purpose? Why am I here? I'm here for a reason. And I thought about it. And I'm like, you know, this is where the things that I struggled with the most and overcame became my purpose. And I was like, well, it's, you know, I went all through school with this horrendous, what was even more challenging was as a, a post-secondary student. And it took about a year and I just kept writing and writing and writing and writing and researching. And when I came across the, this, the fact that so many students like me were entering college and, dro and just dropping out, literally just dropping out or leaving, departing. Um, and I thought, well, wait a minute, I did it. Everybody, everybody, if I can do it, everybody should be able to do it. And I was just jaw, just draw, draw. I can't believe all of these students are not finishing. And then, so I went to the root of it. Is it the students? Is it, you know, then I started researching. Is it, is researching became very, I mean, I spent every night, Saturday, every time that I had researching and researching and reading everything. And here's this, this, the really, Sad truth, <laughs> there is hardly anything about post-secondary students, college students with disabilities. There's virtually no research. And then I will end by saying, uh, stop after this for a second. I knew my purpose. I had to do this because one of my professors at Pepperdine said, your research, the research, the research that I'm going to do is going to contribute to the, the lack of research. And I said, oh my God, that's it. That's what I have to do. And so um, that's how it started. And then I became very hyper-focused, you know, very hyper-focused. I was like, IEPs. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> what was, as you started delving into this and you started speaking and going very mm. public with your data and, and quite honestly, <sighs> The, the courage, I applaud you for the courage to challenge Thank the you. status quo because that's not Thank easy you. in any industry, let alone education. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so what was your, share with our community your biggest fear when, that when you walked to the mirror and you're like, oh, do I want to do this? What was the, the thing that kind of <sighs> you had to overcome to get going? Well, first off, I'm first two two points that I want to make before I forget them. Um, I'm used to naysayers. That's one point, and I'll come to that. Remind me if I forget. And then the other part is, um, and I was 41 before I could even. T I wouldn't even do a podcast or anything like. That. I would never tell. I didn't tell anybody. I was a. I was very concealed. Um, I did what I had to do to fit in with everybody else. And even at work, uh, work was interesting when I didn't understand something. Uh, one of the things I notice about, and I challenge colleges, how come they don't have, you know, they have extra time and they have a separate room and they have these, these, they don't have, explain things a different way. That's all I need. That's all I need is 
somebody says something, I don't understand it. Can you explain that a different way? That's an accommodation and it's never stated anywhere. Mm. Why is that? That's what we need. We yeah. can't have things the way the regular person states it. The non-disabled peer states something one way. We need it a different way, maybe a visual or maybe a graph or maybe something something else. Um, so, uh, but the naysayers, here's the thing with me about fear. Um, I want to say everybody's afraid everybody, every day. Everybody has something, but I'm so used, used to people telling me no since i was a child that's one thing i will say i'm so used to everybody saying no that i just assume that you know every i'm just like they're all gonna think i'm crazy and that's okay i'm gonna do it anyway <laughs> so here's why if i listened to that voice this goes back to my why my purpose if i listened to all those voices oh you have to do what everybody else is doing oh you have to do this oh you have to be a nice girl oh you can't make you know you need to make friends you can't not make friends you can't it can't do i'm i'm on the road less traveled than i have been all my life so i just did my own thing and i thought you know what that's what's gonna have to happen and sometimes it does get lonely but Here's the thing. I think in my heart, if I know I'm doing the right thing, and um, it's just like with this book, if this is something that maybe 20 years from now, if I've laid a groundwork for something and somebody else, this is their saving book later, then I've done what I need to do. Mm. Amen. <laughs> Amen, right? Like, yeah. And I, I share that with our community all the time when, when sometimes people just don't feel their story is valuable or like, oh, I don't, I'm just an average person. Everybody I'm has a different story and they are valuable. Thank Everybody's you. story Everybody. is valuable. Everybody. And, and here's the thing. And nobody's the same. Toby, here's yeah. the thing. If you and I sat down and you said, Jared, write something and it's going to change one person's life somewhere in the world, we would yep. both say, let's do it right now. Like we wouldn't even yes. slow down. Yes. <laughs> Yes. But when we yes. get in comparison mode, we're like, well, only one person's going to read it, right? That kills you. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I don't get deterred by that. If I love one it. person, if I, if that one person needs me, then that's, that's that one person and that's okay. Now, let me um, ask you this. Let me interrupt you there. I love it. I love it. Sure. I, you're, I love the energy. Let me ask you this. You said something that I want to follow up on. You said you were 41 years old. Yeah. Before, and then we went into the naysayers. Were you saying you were 41 before you started publicly saying, like, I have a, I learned differently? Is that what you were telling me? It took me that long. Wow. Yeah. It, <laughs> to, I mean, because think about it. Yeah. From 20 to 40, you're at work. You're earning. You're, no, but you're at work. Yeah. You're not, first of all, think about your resume. Never. I always, when I advise, I help, I help people with resumes when I tell them, Never, ever, 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 ever put your, you don't put, I have ADHD on your resume. Mm -mm. No, if you wouldn't put it on your resume, why would you tell anybody? So I wrestled with that of I'm in the work and I'm working. I'm a teacher now. I'm a, you know, I was a, a BII, like a, a behavior interventionist for a couple of years. And so why would you put that on your resume? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I even even 20 years ago is this is before internet so you know it is a, in that sense like it was a long time ago and so um things things have laws have changed things I mean remember when I was in school we didn't have IDEA 2004 and we the law has changed for for students with disabilities um it, it's not like it was in the 70s but you know if I if I think about the fact that, you know, if I waited, you know, I, again, with the naysayers, so many people tell me every day and I expect it, bring it on. Uh, oh, they will never be IEPs in college. And I'm like, you know what? They said that when they, you know, people in wheelchairs, how do you, we don't have infrastructure. We don't have the sidewalks. Oh, we'll never have that. Never know. You know what? Again, 15, 20 years from now, maybe 10 years from now, the laws will change and things will change. And I, you know, I didn't want to wait to put my book out there. So I had a message I'm waiting, you know, I'm not one to wait because you don't know how long you're going to be on earth. And so 
Yeah. You know, don't wait for tomorrow. You might not have a tomorrow. Do it for now. Sure. What was the reaction like when you, from your peers and your coworkers? What did they say to you? It depends. On, it depended on the person. And I'm going to be honest. Um, there were a lot of people who, I guess, and it's it's sad, but there was the, the stigma impacted the stigma, and it impacts parents too. The stigma um, of having a disability. Uh, you're still the last one chosen. People don't maybe don't want to work with you or they're not sure you'd be good on their team or, um, you know, you they they feel like they're helping you in some way. Um, there's still a lot of that. Um, so it's not a perfect thing that now that I've said, oh, I have a learning disability and ADHD, all of a sudden everybody says, great, come join us. That's absolutely not the case. But the value in it is I feel like I've made it easier for other people. Like I said, I've already graduated. I'm, a, you know, I'm the vision of grit. I get in professors' faces. Some of the things I recommend were go to office hours and stay there until you get what you want. I mean, it's, you know, you're, you, you gotta, you know, people who are shy, I'm not shy. People are, people have different personalities, but, um, but, the thing is, you know, how do I get my needs met? You know, I'm like, I'm going to get an A on this paper. So I'm sorry you don't want to work with me, but I'm still going to get an A on this paper. So thank you. You know, um, so I, I, and I also believe that um, there are people who, you know, you, you attract people by having positive energy. So, you know, whoever's supposed to be in my life will be there when I need them. So I, I do believe that, that, you know, you, you have to, if you're moving up or if you're moving around, you know, you, people come into your, your life when you need them. And that was the same thing with um, professors or teachers. Um, one of the special ed teachers at um, Great Valley High School where I graduated, um, my senior year, I saw what she was doing to help me as the resource teacher and I said, well, what is she, how, when she was advocating for me. So I started modeling that because I thought, oh, she's not going to be there next year. I'd better watch her to see what she's doing. And I just instinctively started doing that so that I could bring that with me. But I don't want students with disabilities to go to college and feel like they're missing something. Um, I had to, you know, when I was in college, I had to really be scrappy so um scrappy. it is just in a t scrappy yeah I, I would definitely say that's a great term for you you seem scrappy <laughs> <laughs> i well and so you know when you're ready to talk about my college experience let me know because that yeah that um there's a difference between the k through 12 even though i switched to a lot of schools it was just you know, rotating the earth kind of changing when I went to college. So let me ask you this, because I, I noticed that one of the things you talk about is the law. The actual law oh, yeah. needs to change mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. colleges accept IEPs. As a parent, I had no idea that if Why my, not? Right, I would just assume. No, I mean, why not have IEPs in college? I would have just assumed why that if, not? if a kid was getting supported – or learning differently, and it was identified earlier, if I started paying money to be educated, I would have that. So uh, tell me, why don't I have that already? Uh, the national law has not been changed, and that's what I literally wrote in my research. Uh, I did about 20 pages of research on the ADA and the IDEA. So in a nutshell, in one sentence to just clean this up so that it's not a long thing, I have a visual in my book of one side of all the um, accommodations a student gets K through 12 versus all the accommodations they get in college. And it is just completely uh, opposite. Um, you were talking about the IEP in high school. Well, and then they, they get all these things. And then when they go to college, those become optional. Why? Because the laws change. The IEP is covered. The individualized mm -hmm. education plan is covered by IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. That's IDEA. Yeah. The minute a child, a student, 18, 19, whatever they are, they receive their diploma from high school, 
like a like a door slamming snap of the fingers all the the laws that follow that person change the law changes huh. it's not it's literally you're not you go from getting the services to here's your piece of paper now you're not getting the services good luck Wow. I had no idea. Thank you. That's why I wrote the book. <laughs> because I want everybody in the country to know this is really very super duper not cool. For and sure. I urge Congress to pass a law where IEPs travel to college. And that's your RISE Act? It's not. Actually, the RISE Act is not um, – as um, mine's very, my, my idea is very explicit. Why not have them literally travel to college? All colleges in the U.S. should have the IP just go right to college. Why not? Okay, so there's all kinds of problems with finances and funding and private colleges and these colleges. There's problems. Right. There were problems in the 70s when they decided to change the infrastructure all over the country. And that's okay. There are going to be problems, but it's better to have something in place than not just ignore it um, and not address the real issue is that these students need individualized education at every single college in the U.S., every single college. If you Google it, and this is in my book, there are still colleges that don't have disability students on campus. Really? How illegal is that, I wonder? It, that just seems absurd to me in this day and age that there are still colleges that do not accept all students. Huh. It, honestly, so <laughs> Kelly, that just blows my mind. I had no idea. And then when I go back to yeah. your data, that 72% of students with disabilities won't stay. They go for one year, realize that it's hard, and then leave for whatever reason. They can blame the professor. They can blame the school. They can blame themselves. They might have suicidal thoughts. They might have depression and go on pills, whatever it is. But they're not finishing. They're literally just leaving. And that's not okay, because when things got tough for me, my first year, my first semester, my first year, I went back and kept going. And, you know, when I failed a test, I went to office hours and said, I'm not leaving until we talk about how I can get a better grade. And the professors are like, oh, my God, she's not going to leave. She's going to, like, come home with me and talk to me all night. So I'm like, mm-hmm. So, and, and so, again, uh, and I mentioned this in the book, students, all students who are in school and have, you know, they're working towards students with disabilities struggle with, one, connecting with their professors, and, two, with, they don't know the law, just like we were talking about. They don't know what laws they have. So if a professor says, oh, no, that I don't have to do that, they cannot think about it. Here's a, your, your child is 18, 19, 20, and they're going to challenge a 55-year-old professor who has a suit on and right. he's old. He's going <laughs> to give you a grade. He's going to give you a grade, and yeah. you're going to go up against this guy right. or this woman. And so I would, because that's just my personality, but not every student who has ADHD, you know, a lot of students, they oversleep, they have issues with time, they sleep in late, they sit in the back, they're shy, they're afraid, they, whatever it is. I was the one who sat right in front and I'm like, call me, call me, call me, call me, call me, because I always had, and they were like, oh, it's her again. Yeah. So at some point I'm like, am I going to pass? And they're like, yeah. Oh, great. Because you don't want to have me next semester, do you? So, you know, it's the <laughs> same, you know, so, um, but again, uh, I know my strength as a writer. So I knew no matter what, I would go to the writing center, get assistance, go get, you know, check with my friends. This is before we had, um, uh, in the, when I went to school in the nineties, we didn't have, 
um, technology, we had um, Xerox machines at yeah. the library. So we actually took notes in a notebook. And so I had a, I had friends. Again, I was scrappy. I was like, oh, I'll be your friend. I'll, I'll buy you lunch if, you, if I can copy all your notes or I'll buy you soda or whatever it was. Um, but I was like, I have to get those notes. I don't care what I have to do. So <laughs> because my notes were horrible and right. they didn't have – note takers yeah. now they have note takers at most universities but you have to ask for it and you have to be approved for it if the ip went to college you wouldn't have to ask for it it would just be there fantastic well, i applaud your courage and I, I love scrappy that is just a perfect nickname for you and i can feel your scrappiness right here at the computer Thank you. I appreciate it so much. I want to get my message out there. So, yeah. Well, I appreciate you for standing up and speaking. I, <laughs> as a, a parent of kids that have gone through the schools more recently than I went through, I would love for us to go back. I think going back in time to where students were individuals and it was more about the student success than a standardized test score for the class. Yep. You're absolutely correct. So thank you for right, yeah, challenging you. the status quo. Where <laughs> where can our audience follow along with your journey? Where they can where can they go to support you? Uh, Toby Tomlinson Baker uh, dot net, and um, that's my website. Toby Tomlinson Baker dot net, and um, also on LinkedIn and Instagram and Twitter and um, Facebook or wherever. Um, but yeah, um, tobytomlinsonbaker.net. And, um, you know, if there's ever um, a specific person, they can instant mes message me. And um, I've done um, some speaking events and consulting and all kinds of stuff, all, you know, to help any, like any, anyone that, just one person at a time, if I can help just one person, then that just, it makes it all worth it. I love it. And the book, so. The Traveling IEP, is out on Amazon right now. So get over yep. there. You can buy it directly from there. Uh, yep. Dr. Baker, Toby, thank, thank you so you. much for joining us again this week. Thank you. And remember, team, life is far too short to live any other way than on purpose. We'll see you all again next week. <laughs>